and welcome to the candidate forum for Minnesota Sen Senate District 44, Minnesota House Representatives District 44A and 44B. I'm Deborah Price, the president of the Wyzetta Plymouth Area League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters was formed over 92 years ago to help women carry out their new responsibilities as voters. It encouraged women to use their new power to participate in shaping public policy. We continue as an organization to educate women, and now this also includes men, on the issues of government and welcome your membership. While we as a league do study and take stands on issues, we never support or oppose a candidate or political parties. We do encourage our members as we our members as individuals as we encourage each of you to become involved in your community and the political party of your choice. If you, you would like to have an impact on local, state, and national issues, please pick up membership information tonight or visit lwvmn.org for more information about League. This forum is made possible with the financial support of the Martin Brown Grant and the Minnesota League of Women Voters Education Fund. Tonight you will be hearing from the candidates for Senate District 44 and the House of Representatives 44A and 44B. 44A includes Northwest Plymouth, 44B includes Southwest Corner of Plymouth and extends south to Minnetonka. The Senate 44 includes both those areas. The term for a state senator is four years. House members serve for two years. Both have a salary of $31,140.90 with a per diem of up to $96 a day for travel and living expenses. Tonight we're honored to have a, a junior Girl Scout and a Brownie here helping with our questions. I want you to know it's their 100th anniversary for having Girl Scout. Tonight our moderator is Marty Mix, a member of the Golden Valley Area League of Women Voters. Marty? Thank you. <clears throat> um, again, I'm Marty Mix, a member of the League of Women Voters of Golden Valley, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Now, the first forum will just be for the Minnesota State Senate District 44, and after we finish that, we will then follow it with the Minnesota House of Representatives 44A, and that will take place at approximately 745. And then we'll have the Minnesota House of Representatives 44B at about 825. There will be an eight-minute break time between the forums, and the forums this evening are sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Wyzetta, Plymouth area. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I welcome you. The purpose of this evening's forum is to provide you the opportunity to hear the candidates discuss face-to-face -face the issues that are important to you. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. And the sponsorship of this debate is not an endorsement of any of the candidates. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any candidate or political parties. All viable candidates have been invited. And they are here. Welcome. The rules for this evening's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be allowed an opening statement and a closing statement with a maximum of two minutes to state his or her experience, platform, and objectives. A 15-second warning will be given before the total time is elapsed. So when the candidates see that 15-second thing, if you could bring your statements to a close quickly. Um, and when you see the stop sign, please finish quickly or I will be interrupting. Um, opening statements will be given in alphabetical order and the questions shall be answered in rotating order. And the answers will be confined to one minute unless designated by me if there's a really complex question that we have. No reference of a personal uh, nature will be tolerated and a person's public record may be examined but not their character. These forums are made available to encourage the voting public to focus on the issues and not on the personalities. We ask that there be no demonstrations, that means applause or booing, of support or opposition to the candidates or their statements, and that all candidates be allowed their full time to get their point across. And we will thank all the candidates with applause at the end of the evening. So we will begin tonight's forum. Um, first, I want to say we have Terry Bonhoff right to my left, and she is the incumbent, incumbent DFL candidate, and David Gaither, the GOP uh, candidate. And we'll begin tonight's forum by calling on Terry Bonoff to give her opening statement. And you will um, have two minutes. 
Well, thank you very much, and good evening to all of you. I thank you for being here, and I also want to say a special thank you to the League of Women Voters, and particularly our Brownie and our Girl Scout. We appreciate you for being here tonight. I have represented this community since 2005 when I won a special election. Uh, it was quite a thrill for me, and I can tell you that it has been an honor to serve you. And I actually think you have trained me to be an effective legislator because of how engaged you are, how informed. You have high expectations and high standards, and I thank you for that. I came to the legislature with little political background. I had a 20-year career in business. I grew up in Edina. I went to college at Clark University, graduated and came back here. I see my dad back there, and I, I joined the family business after college. My grandpa bought Jackson Graves in 1946, turned a hat shop into a ladies' uh, chain of women's ready-to-wear stores. My dad took that over, and I joined him. I had my first son said I wasn't going to work there, and shortly thereafter, the stores closed due to really tough economic times, sort of similar to what we're experiencing today. I went to Tonka Toys, I was in marketing there, and I ended my career at Navarre Corporation, where I started out as a director of merchandising. The computer products division ended as the vice president general manager of that division. So I have a broad and diverse background in business, yet I left that business world to be home with four teenagers threw myself into their world, serving in the community, and being part of that life. And it was such a gift to be able to do that in my life, that when my kids were going off to college, I decided, in fact, I wanted to serve. I ran for office, and here we are today. So what I can tell you about my record of service is that I brought my business background and my lack of partisanship to bear and have truly led as a moderate, a moderate whose record has included being endorsed by organizations such as the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, the Twin West Chamber of Commerce, and I am proud to be here today as your senator, and I look forward to a, this evening's conversation with David. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear the opening statement from David Gaither. Thank you, and thank you for all for coming tonight, and again to the Women, League of Women Voters for hosting this event. I appreciate that, and thank you for Terry for showing up as well. Thank you, Terry. Um, by way of background, I grew up about 500 feet from here in the Kavanaugh edition right down the street. Went to Wyzetta High School. I actually went to Ridgemont Junior High, now known as East, and then to Wyzetta High School where I see Mrs. Gamrat in the front row, who was one of my social studies teachers. Nice of you to see here, Grace. Um, and I spent most of my professional career in the private sector working as a uh, salesman to start my career, moving up to different levels of management, and uh, ended up starting some companies and creating jobs and hiring people, and I know what it takes to make a payroll. And most of my time in the community has been in a volunteer capacity. I've run the youth football program. I've been on the planning commission, sitting at the end of the table here, and uh, working in the school district and the Citizens Financial Advisory Council and just being a community-involved individual. In 2002, without any political experience, I raised my hand to be elected to the Minnesota State Senate, and I won. And so that's a little bit of background on me. Uh, the voters in this district have a unique opportunity in this election. We have the ability to compare and contrast two voting records of two individuals who have served and are serving currently. Further, and based upon my conversations with the voters at the door and throughout the community, it's clear what they expect from me and my opponent, which is to discuss the pressing state issues and refrain from negative campaigning and personal attacks. I'm pleased that our campaigns for the Senate District 44 has complied with these issues and expectations. And both my opponent and I have worked hard to stay on that level. And I look forward to a vigorous and spirited debate on the issues on hand, issues such as higher income taxes, higher sales taxes, higher gas taxes, issues such as spending and our priorities of spending. But the biggest question we've got in front of us right now is, do our children have a better opportunity to future than we did? I'm concerned that they do not, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this can, uh, we will now start the question and answer period, and they'll be given one minute to answer the questions. And again, it'll be a 15-second warning. Let me stop. So here's our first question, and we will begin with David Gaither answering that. We're going to be rotating the orders back and forth. What is your number one legislative priority? In other words, how would you achieve it if your party's leadership did not consider it a priority? So it's kind of two questions in one, isn't it? Well, I'll go back to an overarching vision and um, concern I've got for the area itself. When I'm out door knocking, the biggest question I have from people is, do our kids have a better future in front of them than we had in front of ourselves? 
And the answer to that is probably most cases no. When I'm talking to moms who've got college-age kids sitting in their basement with a degree and no jobs, that's a concern. The concern about spending is a concern. So it's not a legislative priority, but a vision and an important issue for our entire community at large is how can government effectively help these particular individuals in a way that has got the most utility and the most advantage for most of the people. It's a question of the size, scope, and influence of government. So in terms of legislative priorities, I, like to, I want to do the most good for the most amount of people with the simplest acts. Thank you. Terry Bonoff. As I have been talking to people in the community, I have been struck by really the pain that so many families have experienced in this economic recession. I think it has truly been a game changer for everyone. There's no family that's gone unscathed. And so I would say my priority is to do everything in our power to create an environment where our economy can thrive, where businesses choose to stay in Minnesota, where we keep what's here and we attract new ones. We do that on many fronts, and we have to be um, effective on many fronts. We have to, yes, cut government spending, and I've worked hard to streamline that, but also we have to do it by making sure our youngest children from, you know, three and four years old through post-secondary have the greatest education in the world. They are our secret weapon. I think about the young adults today and their knowledge and ability to use technology to propel us all forward, and I know that partnership, with the partnership between us and our young adults, that is the key to our future. And so those are the kinds of issues that I will be working on. Thank you very much. Well, this is a little bit of a hard question, but <clears throat> it starts out with a statement. The Southwest Light Rail Line will help serve um, 60,000, or will help save 60,000 new private sector workers and provide 10 million rides a year, according to the Twin West Chamber. Do you support this increase in economic opportunity and jobs in our region? I'm first? Yes, sorry. I do support it. And I've actually already seen some things my opponent has written on this subject, and he's talked about the false choice, really, between widening 394 or supporting the Southwest Light Rail. And I think that lacks a vision and it lacks leadership because, in fact, we need both. We have to widen 494. That is an immediate concern. I have a letter in my possession where MnDOT sent to, uh, I see Council Member Judy Johnson and the mayor thanking their legislators for our leadership and making sure that happened, and there is a plan in place, and frankly, it's not moving fast enough. But on the Southwest Light Rail, that's an economic imperative for our future. You know, I was at an event last night with the president of the University of Minnesota and the CEO of Cargill and the chancellor of Minskew, and when I asked them what we can do to partner with them to attract new businesses, I was shocked when what they said was, bring us transit. I'm like, really? And they said, yes, that's what the companies are telling us. We have to have it to be competitive. Thank you. David Gaither. Well, this is a clear distinction between the two positions. Light rail, $1.25 billion to construct. Maximum capacity, 30,000 riders. 494, 95,000 cars a day. 95,000 cars a day. 50 million to construct. 20 times more expensive to build a light rail system than to expand the existing 494 route. Light rail does not carry commerce, has limited utility, and if you talk to the people who work in my organization who are right on the Hiawatha line, they will tell you that their commute time is increased, not decreased, on the way to work because of the Hiawatha line. So the notion of congestion relief is specious. The notion of cost is clear. The notion of utility is obvious. So lanes before trains, yes. that's what we think we should be focusing on. The only place that 494 is not expanded in a three-lane capacity is right here in Plymouth. Rebuttal. All right. Very good. So um, I actually have seen the, the work, David, that you've uh, put forward about the Southwest Corridor, and it's got some misinformation about it. It talks about $36 million a year that we would have to pay to operate it. And in fact, after you subtract the revenue that the fare box would give you, it's quite a bit less than that, and that would be split between the county and the state. But not only that, it's actually misinformed to keep talking about a choice between 494 and the Southwest Light Rail. They come from those funds that would would 
do South Best Light Rail versus 494, those funds aren't fungible. The gas tax, we are all funding our roads. It is not free. We fund them by plowing them. We fund them by taking care of them. We fund them by repaving. We are spending an inordinate amount of money on the road system, and that's an important thing. But it would be misguided to have that be the only thing. This money is something that's entirely different, a different revenue stream, and we have been identified Thank as you. one of ten best routes in the country in terms of efficiency and ridership. Thank you. We will have a minute and five seconds if David Gaither wants to do a rebuttal. I would like to thank okay. you very much. Uh, oh, you want to do that now? I would like to okay. do that now. Okay. You got a minute and five seconds. Then. Thank you very much. Um, money is fungible. Okay, It's all yours. The tax dollars from the federal government are your tax dollars. The tax dollars from the state government are your tax dollars. The tax dollars from the county government are your tax dollars. The tax dollars from the city government are your tax dollars. So when it comes down to money, it's your money. And $50 million to expand a road that hauls commerce, in addition to buses and transit, in addition to private folks in their cars, is not a false choice. It's the right choice. It's the right thing to be doing. The priorities aren't necessarily one over the other. The priorities are what makes the most amount of sense for the most amount of people at the least cost possible. That's what we're talking about here. This is not a new issue. This has been an ongoing issue of time over time over time. And when we have a DFL U.S. Senator and a DFL majority in the U.S. Congress in the Senate, one would think that with leadership at the DFL level in our state, we could work with those people at the federal government to shift their priorities to match ours. Well, I have a question now that I don't think you'll probably be rebutting. I guess well, let's, let's see how this goes. <laughs> how would you provide sufficient funding for our state's aging wastewater systems, which left unattended, could create a greater public health disaster? And we'll start with David Gaither. Well, obviously, wastewater treatment and the natural environment are things that are very close and dear to my heart. As a lifelong conservationist, well before it was fashionable to be one, I understood the value of investing in these processes, investing in clean water, clean air, renewable resources like lumber, trees. So in terms of the funding mechanism for it, it's a broader issue than a district-wide issue. It's a broader issue than a regional issue. It's a statewide issue, so you need to have a collaboration between state, local, and county governments to make sure that the average cost for this process is shared adequately by those who use the services. So in a sense, it's an issue that has to be socialized for the greater good conversation and shared amongst all of us, business and residential. Thank you. Terry Bonoff. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, nobody likes to talk about wastewater. You know, it's like, ooh. But uh, it's really important, and the cleanliness of our water is really important. And we do rely on the partnerships between local governments, between the state government, and, um, and what's happening at the federal level. We must continue to make clean water a priority. I was proud this uh, just this cycle to be endorsed by Clean Water Action and by Conservation Minnesota because whenever I am confronted with a choice, should we do the right thing for our future, for our children's future when it comes to things like water and the environment, or should we do something expedient, I look at it and say we've got to protect here today for the next generation. Thank you. Um, our next question will be getting with Terry Bonoff. How do you propose to deal with the deferred funding to education? I've got a couple of questions all on that. You know, what are your views on the legislative borrowing money from the K-12 last year? So oh. basically looking at that, dealing with the deferred funding. Yeah. So that's the school shift. That is such a disappointment to me that in order to balance our budget, what we ended up doing was borrowing from our schools. So that was not top choice in my book by any stretch of the imagination. And if you recall, before coming to that solution, there was a government shutdown. And so the inability of two sides to work together is perilous. It's perilous nationally, and it's perilous for our state. 
I think, and at the time, what I was advocating for was real sweeping tax reform so that we could change the way we have our revenue stream so that it is more stable and we don't have a situation every two years or every four years where we run out of money. I you know, I don't think that we ought to have borrowed that kind of money. I think we ought to have been willing to be courageous and do what it took to pay our bills in real time. The Republican majorities at that time put forward that deal, as well as borrowing from the future tobacco settlements. There is something in law that says how we'll pay back the shift, and, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Gaither. This has been an ongoing challenge for prior than the last legislative session. When the DFL majority was in the Senate, they offered the shift as well, and that was accepted. So this has been an ongoing issue. So one can say, well, what we should do is continue to fine-tune the existing model and figure out how we're going to pay back the shift as quickly as we can and from what source of revenue. Obviously, we all know that the government has got two constitutional mandates in terms of funding. One of them is K-12 education. I would propose a slightly different model. I would propose that we change the education formula so that we allow for greater flexibility at the school district level, greater flexibility on an individualized basis to meet the needs of all the individual school districts around the state, which are unique and different. So as opposed to having uh, raising taxes on one particular group of people or a series of people, which is what my opponent has proposed over time, I would propose we first start with shifting the formula to a more equitable and easier to manage formula without all the categoricals that a state or a school district must have in place in order to make their bills. Rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so David just said that um, that his opponent has proposed raising taxes on one group of people over time. So I'm not proposing that. And um, in particular, I think that if we do not address the budget deficit on a global basis, we are going to find ourselves in the same place. We don't currently have a tax structure that allows us to pay our bills year to year. We find ourselves every two years back in the situation. And so Governor Plenty, recognizing this, he actually created a 21st century tax commission. That tax commission said we rely too heavily on the income tax. We have to expand the base of our sales tax. We ought to lower some of the business taxes so that we can remain more competitive and really be able to grow our economy in, these, in this situation. So this is what I'm advocating for. I certainly don't advocate for picking one group over another in terms of uh, raising any kind of taxes. Rebuttal? Yes. <laughs> um, interesting. Uh, my opponent voted for increasing a tax bracket, a top tax bracket, the top 9 percent. Well, that's looking at one group and saying that's where we ought to get the money. We don't have a revenue problem in the state. Our revenues are growing each year. What we have is expenses that are exceeding the revenue growth. And so when we talk about what we need to do with government, when we've got increasing revenues, I think it would be appropriate to take a look at how those increasing costs are, relatively, are affected by those increasing revenues. So if costs are outstripping revenues, but revenues continue to go up, and we've got a recession going on that's probably as drastic a recession as we've ever had in this country in my lifetime, increasing taxes is counterintuitive in this environment. I think the spending conversation first, then the revenue conversation following it is more germane and more relevant. Rebuttal. You know what? I think I'm going to ask another question, and it might actually get at. <laughs> Tell me after I ask this next question whether we need a rebuttal. Because okay. I, the only thing I would say is that. Can I, can I, sure, you thank try. You so much. Let's we'll do try it this. Let's way. try this. I think she's in Minnesota charge. faces a budget deficit. What three steps would you propose to balance the budget? So we'll start with um, David Gaither. It doesn't answer that rebuttal, though. You oh, you know what? You, it, you know what? You were the last one to speak, weren't you? you were the last. So it's David Gaither, <laughs> who's. Okay. So are we on the question of balance? What three? Yeah. Things? What three steps would you propose to balance the budget? Maybe that will help us get to where we want to be. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, again, I'll go back to the first thing you do is examine where you're spending your money and how you're spending your money right now. That's the first thing you do. And take a look at the trajectory of that and see are there ways that we can change the narrative in the trajectory of spending. Because most of the autopilot spending increases that we've got have got, have got tentacles to them. They've got tails. And so are there ways that you can actually streamline and modify government? And if there aren't, and only if there aren't ways to streamline and modify government, then and only then do you take a look at increasing additional revenues. And taxes aren't the first place for revenues. The first place for revenues are fees and loopholes. 
And once you figure out fees and loopholes, and last and only last, do you take a look at increasing taxes. So start with the spending conversation, go to efficiencies, go to loopholes for revenues, go to fees for revenues, and the last and very last thing you do is examine the conversation raising taxes on an already high tax state. Thank you. Terry Bana. So, you know, I mentioned in my introduction that I was endorsed by the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and the Twin West Chamber of Commerce. I am not for raising taxes. David has put in writing about this vote. It's, you know, other people have written letters about this vote. One time in my seven-year time period at the final, you know, hour of a session when we did face a $5 billion shortfall, I made that vote after being very clear with anybody who would listen that I thought we needed a different approach. Streamlining. I was carrying three bills around streamlining government. I actually got a call today from the Minnesota High Tech Association to give me my second award for my leadership in streamlining state government. So um, with regard to that vote, after I took that vote, I called on Governor Dayton, who was then candidate Dayton, met with them to tell him I wouldn't take that vote again, that it was wrong, it was the wrong policy, and that he, you know, better change the way he viewed tax policy. And he still teases me about that. He still Thank talks you. about that I won't Thank vote you. that way. So I would ask my opponent to refrain from characterizing me in that fashion. Okay. Rebuttal. The next, oh. Well, you get one minute, five seconds then. Okay. <laughs> it isn't one vote. It's multiple votes. Senate file uh, 681, 9% tax bracket, uh, top tax bracket. 2007 transportation bill, $5 billion tax increase. Th th voted against a $300 million personal small business tax relief bill voted against expanding research and development credits to small business in 2009, voted against reducing the, the estate tax. And further, in addition to that, she authorized this bill to allow school districts to levy without taxpayer approval. This isn't a one-time episode. This is a pattern. It's a pattern of a philosophy, a philosophy that I just don't agree with. It's okay to have that philosophy. It's okay to have your own opinion on that philosophy, but you're not entitled to your own facts. I get a rebuttal. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you didn't think it was just going to be smooth sailing, did you hear? <laughs> um, you know, I'm not going to go through vote by vote. I will just say a couple things. One is there's a new commercial out where uh, David actually says he's the only one in this race that's never cut funding to education, and I actually have the vote in the bill where in 2003 he cut funding to education. And that's okay because that is sometimes you, you take votes that are tough, and that's what leaders have to do. But I will say it's important to be honest and to be transparent. And so here's where, you know, you're trying to get me on this vote or that vote, and I am proud of my record as an effective legislator, and I'm proud of my relationship that I have with the people I represent. And I would ask you, David, to be transparent about your own record. I've heard you speak with pride about your time in the governor's office, yet I was there, and your tenure was cut short, and it was common knowledge that you were asked to leave. And so I think if we're going to talk <coughs> about records... Let's, let's be careful on what we're saying here. Um, thank you. I lost track of how many rebuttals we got here. I, David, were you at a rebuttal point, or should I, I, I start think with we've kind of kick this one? All right, down. all right. Should the welfare system be changed, and if so, how? And we'll begin with Terry Bonoff. <clears throat> I think we do have to change our welfare system. I think when you look at the amount of people who are not making a living wage, when you look at the amount of people who aren't finding themselves in a place where they see a path words up and where they are using government services to help themselves and their family, and nobody wants that. So I think we have to find ourselves in a situation where we say time out. What's working? What programs are working? And if those programs are working, then let's invest in that and let's help people move themselves out of poverty. Poverty is a disease. You know, having no hope, having despair when you're a single mother, that's something that's pretty sad. So I think welfare is a safety net, but we want to make sure our safety net is also a leg up. We need to make sure our programs are giving the people a leg up. Thank you. David Gaither. 
Government should take care of those least able to take care of themselves. If you're unable to take care of yourself, government should step in. If you won't, that's not government's problem. Our welfare system in the state is robust. We have an immigrant population that attracts, is attracted here for the social service network that we have. In some levels, it's quite good. In some levels, it's wonderful. But there's a prone, there's an ability and a propensity for abuse. When you've probably heard stories about the debit cards that are issued to welfare recipients being used in California and Hawaii and Florida, one can only scratch your head and ask themselves the question, why is that the case? I'm not going to cast aspersions on those people who might be using those cards for purchases outside of the state of Minnesota, but it certainly merits examination. So again, the welfare system is designed to help those that can't help themselves, not that won't help themselves. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we'll begin this next question with um, David Gaither. What should be the state's role in providing health care to low-income Minnesotans? Well, this is a very topical issue right now in light of the federal legislation that's been passed and the Supreme Court's ruling on same. My fundamental belief in the health care system is that it's flawed because of one particular dynamic. There is no direct relationship between the supplier of the service, the payer of the service, and the recipient of the service. I know more about how much it's going to cost to build my deck in the back of the house than I do about my knee construction. That's one of the fundamental problems of this. So what I have always advocated for is more competition in the marketplace. Healthcare costs aren't going up everywhere. LASIK surgery has gone down in cost. Cosmetic surgery has gone down in cost because they're not covered by insurance. There's a direct relationship between the receiver of the service and the payer of the service. So in that context, more market forces, more competition, more transparency in the health care services I think will be beneficial to everybody, everybody in the state. The last thing we want to do is have government running our health care system. The question was about what are we going to do with low-income people with regard to health care. And we in Minnesota have a nation-leading model. We have something that is called Minnesota Care. Minnesota Care is a program that's based on your ability to pay. It's scaled depending on what you can pay. It's not a government program. We actually have the private market supply insurance to the low-income population and it works wonderfully so that Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medica, Health Partners, those are the providers to the people on Minnesota Care. When we looked at the national program, what was happening, I was disappointed that the model was Massachusetts because, in fact, we in Minnesota have the lowest uninsured, the lowest cost, and we have a public option. And we do all that because we have the best doctors, the best health care system in the country with the Mayo Clinic, with the Lina, with the university system. We need to use our knowledge, our ability to lower costs, provide high quality health care, and Thank you. spread that around the country. Thank you very much. Um, let us, we'll start with you, Terry. Uh, Bonhoeff, uh, what areas of education policy, if any, would you like to see reformed? Well, I've been a strong champion for education reform, and it's something that excites me really uh, more than anything else I work at at the Capitol, and that's because the the upside is so great. If you look at our top scores of our best and brightest, we lead the nation. But yet, at the same time, our achievement gap is second worst in the country. That gives us an enormous opportunity to make some real significant changes. And so I have a reputation for being outspoken and for standing sometimes on the outside of my party to say we need to make some major changes. And there are stakeholder groups that resist those kind of changes. I championed the alternative teacher licensure law. I uh, was an outspoken leader on the effort to say if you have a teacher in your classroom and you have a layoff, in order to decide who gets laid off, you should be looking at performance first. That's not the only thing. We need to leverage technology so that each child can be engaged in Thank a new you. way. Thank you very much. Uh, David Gaither. Education reform is very, very important to me. My wife serves on the Wyzetta School Board. Like I said earlier, I went to Wyzetta. Um, one of my best friends was on the Wyzetta School Board for a number of years. One of the things that we talk about in the achievement gap is if, what's the problem? There are models by which it works. There are 90-90-90 schools that look at a different model of education to change and to alter that achievement gap. It's not a revenue conversation. 
It's a structural conversation. It's about subject matter mastery. Change the way our education system works. Don't promote kids because they've got a year older. Promote them when they've mastered the subject they've got in front of them. Change the model in education so you're teaching to the individualized education needs of an individual student. Put those policies in place so that kids can move through the curriculum as they've mastered the skill as opposed to being chronologically a year older. Go back to those kind of 90-90-90 schools like Harvest Prep that's got a track record of success in the area. Thank you very much. And this will be our last regular full minute response um, question. Why can't the Republicans and Democratic legislators work together for the good of the state? And we will begin with David Gaither. Well, I would invite anybody who is interested in this to go to my website and take a look at a video that was done of me in 2005 when others define me as reaching across the aisle. Others define me as working with the opposition party. I have a long history of working with people with divergent interests, coalescing around common goals. That's my objective. I don't care who gets credit for it. I don't care who gets up on the floor of the Senate and makes the speeches. I don't care who carries the bill. I care about getting it done. So if the Democrats have got a great idea on something, that's fantastic. If the De Republicans have a great idea on something, that's fantastic. But the most important thing we need to do about getting things done is to quit making it personal. Talk about the ideas, not about the individual. Talk about the outcomes, not the process. Be respectful of each other and our differences. Put the suffixes away. Focus on the common good. Thank you. Terry Bonoff. Thank you. That is what we need to do, is focus on the common good. As I, I uh, said, my slogan since 2005 was uniting the middle because it is so important that we find a way to work together. And as a marketing person, that was just a saying I came up with, trying to communicate that that is my vision, that we reach across the aisle and we do work together. I was in the minority these last two years. So you don't carry as many bills in the minority and you're in a different role. I carried, I guess it was about uh, 32 bills. 17 of them became law. They didn't become law because the governor just signed that bill. They became law because I worked with people on the other side. Things like the Wyzetta School District needed to expand without raising taxes, and we had to change a law. The Minnetonka School District had a problem with their language immersion program. They were going to have to fire 18 teachers. I worked with Jen Olson. I worked with Keith Downey to do the IT Consolidation Act where we took the IT services from being in 70 Thank agencies you. and now they're in one. That's what it is to be effective and work in a bipartisan way. Thank you. I hate one-minute answers. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I could do ten-minute answers. Maybe we can get an extra five seconds. We'll, okay, we'll catch them up. Um, we're now at the lightning round questions. So these will be 15 oh, seconds. I know. 15 <laughs> seconds. You can do it, Terry. No we, way. Yes, I'm sure you will. So here is one question. It's going to be easy. Do you support the proposed amendments to the Constitution? Maybe I'll just start first. Voter ID. And we'll start with um, Terry. Do you support the I, I don't support the, I, the amendment. I do support voter verification with a modern technology-based system that is e-poll books. I've spoken about it before. You can hear my remarks. I can't tell you in 15 seconds, but it will be cheaper, more effective, and will guarantee 100% voter integrity. You know, 100% is anything ever really 100%, but I'm telling you, I share the people's value that we must have voter integrity. I don't think the right way to do it is with the constitutional amendment. I think it's old school and we've moved past Thank it you. pretty soon. We're going to be Thank putting you. our finger. Thank you. All right. It, just so 15 seconds. So, David Gaither. I'll try to follow the rules. <laughs> oh. The answer to the question was this voter ID amendment, not what we'd like to have. We navigate from where we are, not where we'd like to be. The answer to this question is, I think it's appropriate to, to be who you say you are when you go to the polling booth. So, yes, I'm both in support of this. Okay. Then we'll ask the next one. Do you support the proposed amendment to the Minnesota Constitution on the definition of marriage? And we'll start with David Gaither, 15 seconds. My brother came out in the mid-70s. It's an informed opinion that I have. I support the amendment. We have something in common. My brother came out in the mid-70s, too. He's in the back row back there. And uh, 
And I oppose the amendment. I think that uh, it's not government's job to decide who should marry, and I don't think the Constitution is any document that should put something in it that limits the rights of anyone. Thank you. And now we'll again start with Terry. What are two budget areas that you would recommend reducing, reducing given the projected deficit? Two areas. I would uh, reduce state government, and I would do it by the redesign. I spoke about the IT consolidation during the interim. We've actually embarked on a study to figure out what next can we consolidate. We're looking at our back office functions and comparing the costs of delivering those to what other states and the private sector does. All right, thank you. Um, David Gaither, and you got about eight or nine, uh, an extra eight seconds on that one. Plus the 15. It's about 22. The first area of, of reducing government spending is government itself. The biggest cost we have are our employee costs. And unless you bend that curve, unless you change that narrative, you're not going to make meaningful changes in government. So I would propose that if you had a cross the board uh, proposal of saying every three people that you lose, you replace two of them and force innovation and creativity down the, uh, the various commissions, I think you get the result you're looking for. Thank you very much. And we will now begin our closing statements, and we'll do it in the reverse order. So um, we'll have, oh, I, let's see, we, Terry opens, so then David will close first. <laughs> okay. We're good? Was that a question that or is that a statement? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, huh? Uh, yeah, I, I think we had said we can reverse. That's you. That's okay. fine. Well, uh, thank you to all of you and to the League of Women Voters again for hosting this forum, and thank you, Terry, for participating as well. I think as we open the conversation, the voters of Senate District 44 have a clear choice. Two voting records to compare and contrast, two perspectives on the problems we have in front of us, two experienced people from which to choose. It's a good choice. It's what our Constitution and our founding fathers thought would be a good choice. Competition, divergent views, the open exchange of ideas amongst people who've got different, object or different paths to similar objectives. I can tell you that having served there in the Senate before, it's an honor to have served. It would be an honor to serve again. I'm invested in this community. I'm really invested in this community. What happens here matters to me. And so, as we go forward on the campaign trail, I look forward to more vigorous and, and spirited debates on the issues, on what matters to us, and our records. Thank you all again, and thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you, David. And now we'll be hearing from Terry for her closing statement. Thank you. Well, I hope after uh, this conversation that you are left with my appreciation and my respect for who you are, because my ability to be effective as a legislator is a direct correlation of our partnership. I have been blessed with a tremendous outpouring of support, support from the broadest community, whether it be the teachers, whether it be the um, Minnesota Chamber, the Twin West Chamber, whether it be Clean Action Energy, or people like Mayor Terry Schneider or Councilman Tim Bildso. People have called me, they've come to me and they've said, I appreciate your partnership because together we are getting stuff done and together we can make the kind of changes that we know Minnesotans want. These are perilous times. These are times where we have to rise above partisan politics, where we have to say, how can we bring our very best spirit together to move Minnesota forward? What ideas do we have? How can we be our best to serve? I ask for your vote on November 6th, and I give you my word, I won't let you down. Got another extra 10 seconds there, David, if you want to say No, it. I think we can move on. All righty. Thank you so much. This concludes the Minnesota Senate 44 candidate forum. I want to thank you both so much. You do the next thank you. And the candidates will be available in the lobby for a short time to answer further questions. Thank you. We had a lot of questions I couldn't get to, but thank you very much for submitting them.